Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Colin Kingston. Uh, I'm with High Orthopedics, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, my experience so far with makoplasty. If some of you had joined me the last time we talked about this, it was more uh, that live book, uh, that, that, that time was more about talking about introducing you to um, the Mako. So today I'm going to talk to you about my experience with the Mako so far, answer any questions you have. Um, feedback I got from the last session was um, answering the questions really I think helped tremendously, particularly with um, particularly with, uh, you know, answering questions that people may have that were too afraid or don't know what to ask. A lot of these questions oftentimes are questions that you'll be thinking of and can be very helpful. So um, when I first started using the, the Mako Plasti last year to talk a little bit about it, it's uh, designed to do total joint replacements. We're one of the first groups in the region uh, that has the, the capability of a Mako robot, robot that can do total joint replacements, not just partial knee replacements. Partial knee replacements have been around much longer, uh, and we do have the capability of doing partial knee replacements as well. But total, total knees and total hip replacements are really what I'm going to focus my attention on. But certainly anybody has questions out there about other topics, particularly partial knee replacements, we can talk about that as well. Um, prior to using Mako, I used um, uh, navigation, which uh, I think sometimes can be a little bit uh, confusing. Computer navigation is basically using a computer to map out the person's anatomy and uh, of their knee, and when I map it out, I can look at the deformity and actually real time look at a screen and move it and see what's, what's happening. Then before I make any cuts using navigation, we can then go ahead and make changes as far as the way we're going to make the cuts and then put the implant in. With navigation, the goal is to basically reproduce something called the uh, mechanical axis, where you're trying to get from the center of the hip down to the center of the knee, down to the center of the ankle, and align the leg that way. The difference between navigation and MAKO is that a lot of MAKO is done before you even enter the operating room. Um, you get a CT scan of your hip, your knee, and your ankle to understand both the mechanical axis and the anatomic axis. The anatomic axis is the axis between your femur and um, tibia. Um, and, and those are really important. With hips, it's actually looking also at leg length uh, as one of the issues uh, that will come into play, and also your, your other side or your other hip, and, and figuring out what would be the best component, component positions based on your anatomy, sometimes looking at the other hip, which may not be as bad. So that's, those are kind of like the, the two um, main differences. Um, so uh, today, uh, I'd like to focus a little bit, since the last time I focused a little bit more on total knee, uh, total hip. Um, what we have right here is the um, basically a preoperative CT scan uh, that's taken of the uh, pelvis. And what you can see here is all the information um, that I can get as far as which hip's being done, comparing it as far as leg length, comparing as far as offset as, as the distance from the hip center to um, the shaft of the femur and the neck angle, and all those things can be figured out and calculated long before we even enter the operating room, which in, in theory then should help speed the, the case along because the surgeon, myself, when I go in, I already have a, a game plan in place and I already have a good idea of where we're going to make our cut on the femoral neck, which usually is going to be somewhere around here. I'm already going to have an idea of the way I'm going to implant the cup. I'm already going to have an idea of what size um, stem I'm going to put in. If you look here, this is an example of a total hip system that I use. So you have the acetabulum shell. This one in particular has multiple holes that will allow for additional fixation when I go to put this in if I'm not happy. I don't always use this one. Sometimes I use one that's completely solid, and sometimes I use one that has just several holes, um, depending on what I believe the quality of bone is and what fixation I need to get. In general, uh, what I, I shoot for and what I've already go, go over with our, our technician, um, Griffin is a striker rep who's our uh, robot technician. Um, and he's been doing this a lot of cases with me over the course of this past year. So if you look over here, things that we shoot for are things like the cup inclination angle or abduction angle, and that's this angle this way. You want it to be about 40 degrees. The 
cup version or anna version, you want it to be rotated forward about 20 degrees. So already, um, he already has it in the computer of the way I like to implant this um, component. And here you're getting a sense of where the hip center is right here. And, and the nice thing about this is here, he can move this around. And this is someone's real anatomy because here you can see a big bone spur right here inferiorly and lack of coverage here superiorly. So I already know that maybe before I even put this in, I might want a cup that has multiple holes in it just to get additional fixation because I may not get good rim fixation of the bone around that cup uh, for this one. So again, doing this all preoperatively really helps me as the surgeon figure out what I'm going to do and do it in a more um, uh, uh, proficient manner. Then the stem part is here you can see this green line. This is where the uh, computer is suggesting I make the cut to get the appropriate length uh, as far as the offset of the angle of the neck and the, the prosthesis that goes down the center of the bone. This is called the femoral stem. So um, again, all of this tells me where I should make my cut and roughly the size that would be appropriate for this patient based on their three-dimensional anatomy, not just on their plane films, which can be subject to sometimes um, diffraction and or miscalculation of the size of the implant. So it really helps uh, with that. Then the, an added benefit is one of the things that we can look at is then leg length and make sure that we're not either shortening the hip too much or we're not over lengthening the hip too much. And if you have to say a lot of patients, their number one complaint probably with total hip replacement is uh, the perception of leg length discrepancy. So this really allows us to put it within a millimeter of, of accuracy, which is really uh, very, very nice. So here you can see, before I even did this surgery, this is already what the post-operative x-ray should look like, and, and the computer has already generated that image uh, as far as uh, what we would like. So um, the neat thing about this is, again, the accuracy of the implant going in and the precision of which it, it has. Any other comments, yes. Griffin? So another advantage of this, um, being able to move it, we can move our implants as little as 0 0.25 millimeters, which is very small in 0 0.25 degrees. So we can really precisely plan how we want it. And as you can see here, um, this patient has a nice um, plan that we're going to try and get them back to their original or their other side. We're trying to match their other side. As far as leg length. As far yeah. as leg length, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so that's really, really neat. My experience so far with um, doing total hip replacements this way has really um, honestly revolutionized uh, my uh, outcomes. Um, most of my hips prior to using Mako would spend approximately one night in the hospital and go home the next day. Occasionally some of my older patients would spend a couple of nights in the hospital and go home after about two days. Um, I would say now close to 75 to 80 percent of my hips now are going home the same day. Uh, two to three hours after the operation uh, they're going home. Um, more precision, less operating, less dissection. And I think that's really made a, a, a world of a difference uh, for my patients. So we uh, actually do have a question. Um, yes. Somebody wants to know is how long has the Mako robot been utilized with TOA? Yeah, so how long has the Mako robot been utilized with TOA was the question. It's been utilized, we, we got it September. September of last year. So we don't quite have a full year experience yet, but we're, we're getting there. And you mentioned that the Mako does help improve your surgical accuracy. How does that improved accuracy impact the patient's quality of life following surgery? Yeah, so, so again, it gets back to um, a philosophy. The more accurate you can put in an implant, um, the better off the, the implant will, number one, survive in theory, because now you're not having something, for example, the cup being too vertical, the implant being put in like this, and now the patient's putting weight on it, and you're getting asymmetric wear now of the plastic piece that sits inside that cup. Or, even worse yet, the cup is not put in very well and put in maybe in what we call retroversion, and the, and, the, and the hip can dislocate out the back, or too much anaversion and dislocate out the front. Um, so um, that kind of accuracy prevents those type of uh, complications. 
And I think additionally, when, when people have a leg length discrepancy, um, particularly anything greater than five millimeters, it starts putting a strain on their lower back and it's, it's very it's easy to see them walk because they'll, they'll walk with like a vaulting gait and they, and they won't be happy with their hip. It won't be a more natural gait that they'll have. So increasing longevity, decreasing pain, more accuracy as far as implant position and more accuracy as far as leg length, I think are all um, really honestly superior uh, things that the Mako brings. We also just want to remind the audience, please, if you have any questions about the Mako or anything for Dr. Kingston, please feel free to ask that in the chat. That's what we have here for. He's happy to answer anything you may be curious about. Um, another question we had was, how quickly will a total joint replacement patient be up and walking following surgery? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of newer techniques now with um, uh, anesthesia in particular, where we don't have to put them in such a deep um, uh, area of sedation with the anesthesia. They can actually do um, all kinds of blocks, for example, in the knee. Um, the block that they used to be done is what was called a femoral nerve block, and that would occur right up here, right around the hip region. And that would help with numbing, numbing the knee up, but it would also weaken the quad muscle, and patients would have difficulty ambulating. Now they can do what's called an adductor block right here in the mid-thigh, more on the inside of the thigh, and that takes away probably about 80% of the pain um, associated with the procedure, but does not affect the muscle at all. So people can get up once they clear their, their mind from general anesthesia, usually within one to two hours after the operation, and start walking. With hips, uh, especially the way I do my hip approach, um, which is a posterior superior approach, um, there's, there's no dissection through nerves, there's very little dissection through muscles, and um, patients can get up uh, right away, again, once they clear it. We, I generally don't use blocks for my hips because I don't have to, uh, because it's not as painful in general as, as knee replacements. So we just got another question. How big of an incision do you have to usually make with the Mako, or does it vary based upon what needs to be done? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the, the size of the incision is based really more on the anatomy. If you have a, a football player who's six foot five and has a, you know a distance from here to here, you know from where his tibia tubercle is, he's going to get a much larger incision than a 48 year old, um, uh, you know 125 pound woman uh, who will get a much smaller incision. So the size of the incision really is based on the patient's anatomy. Um, the only downside of using uh, Mako or using um, uh, computer navigation is we do have to make additional incisions to put temporary probes that hold the arrays so that the computer can actually see your anatomy. And when I do a knee, the incision is usually typically from here to here, two finger breaths above the kneecap and right by the tibia tubercle. And there's two additional incisions down here in the mid tibia and they're, they're little poke hole incisions. Uh, and then for the hip, um, since I've been using Mako, there's usually two, sometimes three little poke holes up here on what we call the iliac crest to put, again, those, those pins in to, to feed the computer the, and, and the um, robot the information that it needs. So we have another question that just came in. Is the Mako a new approach for knee replacements prior from five to six years ago? Yes, uh, definitely. So. Um, the first time I found out about Mako was actually back in, I want to say 2007, 2008 um, at Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It was a separate company uh, from the company now, now that uh, it's under, and it was just called Mako, and um, I met the, the doctor who was actually involved uh, with it. And the design back then and the Mako program was designed predominantly to do partial knee replacements. And rather than using a, a, a saw, which is fairly quick and proficient, there was a burr. And, and the sense of the burr was that it can be more precise within a millimeter of accuracy, but using a burr as opposed to a saw would take much longer. Um, and and th that application then progressed to where it wasn't just a medial or lateral unicompartmental knee replacements, then it progressed to doing patellofemoral joint replacements where you just replace the undersurface of the kneecap and you replace the end of the thigh bone for people with isolated arthritis in that um, compartment of the knee. Um, and I think it was an excellent, uh, you know, excellent um, a way of doing it. Um, however, uh, for some, a lot of hospital systems, it was cost prohibitive. And so that's why it wasn't quite as um, popular as it is probably now. 
uh, I think the big difference now is we have the ability not only to do these partial knee replacements much faster and with greater precision, uh, but we also now can do total knee replacements and total hip replacements uh, and soon total shoulder replacements using the Mako robot with uh, enhanced accuracy. So, yeah, it, it, um, I tell people you know, that have severe arthritis, you know, sometimes people keep on waiting and waiting to the next innovation, the next improvement in technology. In my over 20 years of doing orthopedics, I can tell you, um, I think that about every five to six years, I've seen a significant improvement. And uh, I can tell you for me personally, um, for example, doing knees and even hips, the traditional way where you had cutting blocks and jigs, uh, kind of more like the way a carpenter would do it, um, it would take a lot longer and it was less accurate. And you'd have good outcomes, but you wouldn't have great outcomes all the time. And then at right around 2009 uh, time frame, we started using computer navigation. And uh, I think that really was the first huge improvement for me. Um, and that allowed me to put things in within one to two millimeters of accuracy. And then I want to say another big improvement around 2014 came about with a press fit design that Stryker created uh, called Tritanium. So when you look, for example, and I'll bring this closer to you, you look at the surface of this, it's very rough. It actually almost looks like bone. It looks like Cancella's bone. Well, titanium as an element is one of the closest elements to the uh, concept called the modulus of elasticity to bone. In other words, it has very similar physical and structural properties as bone. Bone knows how to do one thing, and that's make bone. So bone can grow into this, and actually you get a nice bond, uh, as opposed to using cement, where you'd have cement, um, the metal bond, and then cement and the bone bond. You now have two bonds that potentially can break or disrupt. And the number one reason long term to revise joint replacements is the breakage of that bond, which we call aseptic loosening, where the implants then get loose. Um, so to me, having this, um, and here's a stem you can see that has the same type of coating that allows uh, the bone to grow into and around so you get proximal fixation. You can see this stem is not coated all the way through because the goal of this stem is for the bone to grow up here, not down here. Um, because if it grows down here and not up here, in theory, this can get loose. The bone doesn't get stressed. Um, there's something called osteolysis where the bone gets very weak and that, that can result in weakness. So this is a very well-designed stem that allows to do that. So um, that was the other big improvement. And then, um, and then finally, um, you know, Mako uh, honestly has um, changed my practice completely. In 2000, and I want to say 16, I did my first outpatient total uh, knee replacement. And um, that patient did very, very well. Two weeks later, I did his other knee replacement. And since that time, my outpatient um, joint practice has grown. Um, but um, grown to the point of where I was doing in 2019 uh, around 10 to 20 percent of my joints outpatient. Now I would tell you it's closer to 75 to 80 percent of my patients now can be done outpatient because of the improvement of the way Mako improves my efficiency and accuracy and most importantly less dissection. One of the things I failed to mention earlier is one of the differences between navigation knees and Mako knees is when I navigate the knee, I'm trying to recreate the mechanical axis, which sometimes means that if somebody has a really bowed knee, I have to release a lot of soft tissue to get it to in the, the parameters that I want it to so that knee can stay nice and straight through a full arc of motion so that person doesn't have trouble going downhill or down steps. With the Mako, there's less soft tissue releases because you're making those adjustments on the computer before you make the cuts and you're recreating the anatomic access, which means that you'll accept the component being slightly off a little bit in the, in the mechanical axis, but perfectly aligned with the axis of, of the knee. And what I have found is that patients then uh, are, are much happier with less swelling, less pain, because I'm not cutting normal tissue like the medial collateral ligament, for example, to straighten out a knee that's somewhat bowed. So I think from that standpoint, it's um, very, very nice. Um, one of the cases I've done recently that really has convinced me why I, I'll ever have a hard time not using Mako going forward is a case that I did where the hip 
was so dysplastic. Maybe some of you have heard what dysplastic means, but basically the ball portion of the hip wasn't in the cup, and this patient's hip had eroded away and was outside the natural cup. And she started making what's called a pseudoacetabulum. In other words, a new cup was being formed where the bowl portion of her hip. And she had about four centimeters of shortening on that side. We preoperative template that. Now, back 15 to 20 years ago, I would use what's called a jumbo cup. This cup would have been much, much bigger to try to go in and accommodate where I think her natural cup was and where now this false cup is and to try to give her the stability and implant that she wants. With the Mako, I was able to bring her hip back down where it belongs within a millimeter of accuracy, get the right um, uh, inclination and right version, and uh, I couldn't be happier. And we lengthened her at least 16 millimeters, and now she's very close to having normal length between her two legs. And the only reason why we can lengthen her anymore is sometimes when you lengthen a leg too much, uh, the largest nerve in the body called the sciatic nerve in the back can actually go to sleep and can result in foot drop. So you have to be very careful when you're dealing with these very complicated primary total hip replacements not to over lengthen the leg and, and, and cause that because that could result in permanent foot drop, not just transient foot drop. So that was to me um, an eye opener and in that case couldn't have gone any better. Um, and that was just done recently. So we actually just have a few shout outs. Um, one person put, I have taken care of many of your patients through home and health. I'm an RN at Hope and Home Care, and all of your patients do great. And then awesome. I'm just saying, Dr. Kingston, you, Dr. Higgins, and Dr. Malou are certainly the best of the best. I wanted to let you know that. Awesome. Another question is, do you have to have physical therapy with a knee replacement? Yeah, so the question was, uh, do I have to have uh, physical therapy after a knee replacement? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, physical therapy is important. Um, a lot of my patients have been putting up with arthritis sometimes too long, and sometimes the deformity of their knee gets too worse or their leg length gets too shortened because the bowl portion of the hip starts to erode away and their leg gets shorter and shorter. And again, one of the reasons why we couldn't lengthen her also was uh, that last case that I just talked to you about where we lengthened her 16 millimeters was because her soft tissues, her muscles and tendons and ligaments were so tight, they wouldn't allow us to put it in any longer. Um, so we couldn't even if we wanted to make her leg any longer on that side. So it's oftentimes with joint replacements, it's not so much it's not so much um, what, 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 what they can do or cannot do. It's almost always related to the soft tissue, the muscles, the tendons, ligaments. And that's where physical therapy really can come into play to prevent your, your knee from getting stiff, from getting your hip stiff, getting your hip weak so that you, you, you kind of lurch when you walk and not, not walking naturally. So physical therapy is a big component of um, the outcome for joint replacements, and we get all our patients into physical therapy almost immediately. So another question is, how soon after surgery can I return to doing my daily activities? Okay, so um, the question was, how fast can you return to activities, daily living, and, and those things that include like walking, hiking, shopping, driving, and things like that. In general, I've had some patients go back to driving as early as two weeks, but my caveat to driving is you have to be off any narcotic medication and you have to be able to pass the loved one's test in an empty parking lot, making sure that you can go from the, the accelerator to the brake very quickly. Um, but, um, but, but three to four weeks is probably closer to four weeks is my average person back to driving. As far as shopping and um, getting out and walking around, some of my patients can do it right away. I've had some of my patients really surprise me. I had an 87-year-old that I did a total knee replacement on uh, five and a half months ago, and um, I had initially booked her to spend the night in the hospital. Two hours after I did her operation, she was walking up and down stairs, she was walking up and down the hallway, and she said she was in less pain than she was preoperatively. Well, that patient has done unbelievably, remarkably well, and, um, and, and by five and a half months, she's doing everything and anything that she wants. As far as the golfers out there, I've had some patients hit a bucket of balls three weeks after their knee replacement or hip replacement. I've had some patients play full rounds by two months without any problems or difficulty. So people can get back uh, fairly quickly. I, I find that people that tend to get plugged into physical therapy early on 
start getting back to their activities of daily living oftentimes do the best than those that uh, try to baby it or, or, or those patients who waited so long that their knee became so deformed or their hip became so shortened that they deal with the stretching of their tissues and are having much more pain than they would have if they would have had the surgery done sooner. And I think that's what I'm seeing more and more often that a lot of my patients have waited um, too long. I just had a patient come in to see me right before I, I'm giving this talk who um, last year I talked, you might want to wait. I have a feeling the Mako might be coming. And this was like in the last summer. And sure enough, the Mako came. Now we have the Mako and he just booked both of his knees being done. Uh, but his deformity is around 10 degrees uh, bowed and 10 degrees right about the, the, the limit of where I tell people we really need to start thinking about doing um, um, knee replacement. Knee replacement, I call it my rule of tens. If you're more than 10 degrees bow-legged, more than 10 degrees knock-kneed, lack 10 degrees of extension, lack 10 degrees of flexion, we really need to start thinking about doing uh, joint replacement because it's the soft tissue that will determine whether you have stiffness or problems or a less than ideal outcome afterwards, particularly if the components are put within 0 0.5 millimeters of accuracy. So we can go another question. Uh, that's a good question. You know, right now, um, I don't know because the hard part is when you have a low complication rate to begin with, it's hard to tell if it's going to lower the complication rate. I think one of the things I've learned with uh, the MAKO is different than the NAV is um, I, I typically with navigation, I will make um, something called the extension gap, which is the gap between the two bones when the leg's completely straight. Um, equal to the gap when your knee's at 90 degrees, which I call the flexion gap. With navigation, I would make that equal. With Mako, and I think it's because it puts it in such precision and I don't release as much tissue, so I'm relying on tissue that may have already been contracted and that tissue may already be tight, that I'm now making the extension gap one millimeter less than the flexion gap. In other words, I'm keeping the flexion gap a little bit looser with Mako because, again, I think that um, that's made a difference, and that's been a learning curve for me um, with it, and that's something that I've changed um, since using it. So you're just saying that ARA makes a positive difference between all of these low complication procedures? That's correct. Fantastic. And we have another question. Does using the MAKO mean the patient will undergo different types of physical therapy than someone who doesn't use the MAKO? Yeah, so what I have seen is the trend is I'm having more and more of my patients opting for outpatient physical therapy where they go to the physical therapy department themselves versus a home physical therapy where they come uh, to their home and work in their home. I think the big advantage of there is that when you work in your home, unless you have your own private gym in your home, you don't have the equipment, you don't have a lot of the tools of the trade that physical therapists can do. Now, for some of my patients, uh, particularly some of my older patients or patients with multiple medical um, problems and diseases, I think that um, home health is still a very valid um, option for a, a, a good percentage of my patients, but that percentage is now diminishing where the outpatient, um, immediately outpatient physical therapy patients is, is increasing. So another question we have is how long can I expect a joint to last? Okay, so the, how long can a joint last? Well. You know, you look at laboratory data. When they, when, when you have companies, you know, take, um, you know, uh, components like this and they cycle it, you know, for so many life cycles. They're trying to replicate everyday activities with a robot, and they're doing this in a time fashion to determine what the wear characteristics will be of their implants and how fast it will wear out. When I started doing joint replacements over 20 years ago, a lot, a lot of the laboratory data, depending on the implant that was, you were using, would say that implants should last somewhere between 18 and 20 years. And that's pretty much what I told uh, most of my patients. And now that I have over 20 years of experience, I can tell you 18 to 20 years for implants that I put in back then is about right. Um, what, what they're testing now, and particularly with the, the type of um, high, highly cross-linked poly, it's the, the plastic of all joint replacements to me is the weak link, but it's also the strong link, so to speak. It's made so much better now than it was 20 years ago. And what we're seeing now in the lab is some implants are lasting on average 33 years. So um, 
I don't know. Implants that I'm putting in now, will they last 33 years? If I'm still around, maybe then I'll know. But if I'm not around, then I'll, maybe I'll know because hopefully I'll be in heaven. But, but that's, the, that's the right answer. So um, 33 years, I tell people if you get more than 20 years, I consider that a B now. I used to consider that an A. Uh, and if you get more than 30 years, that's an A result. Not always. Um, I tell people that I, I, well, people have genetic susceptibility to developing arthritis. As the human genome becomes more and more uncovered, we're discovering uh, more and more genes associated with osteoarthritis. Um, and um, we now know that, yes, people do have a genetic susceptibility, but oftentimes as a sports medicine specialist as well, I take care of a lot of young athletes that have traumatic injuries, um, knee dislocations, patella dislocations, ACL tears, multi-ligamentous uh, knee injuries. Um, and unfortunately, um, for some of my patients, they start developing severe arthritis in their teenage years. So trauma it, it plays a huge role in the development of um, arthritis and oftentimes some patients will have asymmetry between one side and the other. So with the hip, your range of motion will be actually fairly normal. You could actually get um, almost all motion back. Um, one of the neat things, I don't know, do you have that on the? Um, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, so we'll go back to the, he was just going ahead, showing us a knee here, but um, Griffin's gonna show us the hip. One of the neat things about the Mako software is we can actually see when and if what we put in actually starts to impinge or the, the, the stem starts to hit the corner of either your bone or the cup that we put in. And when that happens, that's oftentimes the limit of, of the motion of that, of that extremity. So this is the right hip, um, you know, that would be the limit. But I can tell you that most of my patients' um, motion for hips has never been an issue. I've not had one patient say that they feel like their motion is limited or, or stiff. Um, with knees, because knees are more complex in the sense that a lot of the soft tissues can get tight, scar tissue can form, bending your knee is very important, um, it can happen, and it happens about 10% of the time. So Griffin's going to go ahead and show us uh, things that we can show on the computer when, when and if it impinges. So what we can see here is going to be our virtual range of motion. So right here, um, we can change these values, um, 90 degrees, just different um, values of flexion and see where there's impinge impingement. So right here, we can see virtually our implant based on... This, um, this, this is the femur, the thigh bone, okay, here's the cup, and you can see right now hitting right there, right there on the front of uh, the portion of the um, bone right there. So then now we can make adjustments to our plan and change and make sure there's no impingement and increase their range of motion. And that's a huge, huge advantage that you normally would not. You'd only be able to do it by feel and ranging the hip in the operating room because ultimately all surgeons want to do is put a very stable hip in and make sure that it does not um, dislocate or pop out of place. You know, sometimes people will ask me, you know, why, how can artificial hips dislocate but natural hips really ever dislocate? Um, we haven't invented anything that ingenious uh, called the ligamentum teres, or the ligament that goes from the ball portion of the hip to the cup portion that acts as a check rein. So when that ball goes beyond where the cup is, it holds it in place. So what actually holds it in place is your muscles. Um, but less dissection, less muscle um, so that you have to cut, in theory then increases the stability and enhancement appropriate placement of the implants, changing the implant position based on what you're analyzing with uh, on the computer can really enhance the stability of that uh, and give the surgeon that much more confidence uh, that that patient can go home, can go up and down stairs and not um, worry about them um, dislocating their hip. We were talking about something else before that though, we got back to the impingement. Oh, there's another question. So. Okay. Was when does someone with a bowed leg know that they need to come in? Do they only come in when it starts to be painful, or do you recommend coming in before that? Yeah, I, you know, I used to recommend coming in 
when it starts becoming painful. I no longer do that um, or recommend that. I, I, I had a patient um, the other day come in and he lacks 30 degrees of extension. He has 35 degrees bowed and he walks like this. And this is no exaggeration. And he uses a cane because he's afraid he's gonna fall. But the reason why he's coming in because he's afraid he's going to fall. And I asked him, are you in any pain? He goes, no, I'm not in any pain. It's just stiff and aches. So sometimes patients with high pain tolerances are, are, are the most difficult patients because they wait so long. He's gonna be a very, very difficult uh, knee replacement to be performed, but I'm excited to use the Mako uh, to try to get this uh, knee uh, as best as possible for him so that it's straighter and stays straight when he walks and will no longer need a cane. Um, but I, so I tell people, again, my rule of tens, if your knee is bowed more than 10 degrees uh, or people are saying, boy, you're really commenting, you're starting to walk like a cowboy, you know, you may want to just have your knees looked at, come in, get an appointment and get an opinion. Because, um, again, the longer you wait, the greater the deformity can get um, because you not only wear out cartilage, but you can wear out bone. And the greater the deformity it gets, uh, the harder it is. Even this, to this day, the most predictive post-operative motion, despite all the improvements in technology, is your pre-operative motion. So I had a patient, for example, and I think I mentioned this last time, who had his leg nearly amputated, and he had only 30 to 60 degrees range of motion when the doctor sewed it back on. I saw him two years later. And um, when I did his knee replacement, he can get his leg now for the first time in two years completely straight. When I put his kneecap in place, we can only bend it to 90 degrees because his quad muscle was so scarred down, there was no way of bending it forward. As soon as I move the kneecap out of the way in the operating room, he can bend it to 130 degrees. Now this patient has zero to 90 degrees and he's very happy, but technically that's not the goal. To answer the question earlier, the goal for the hip is to get as much range of motion without impingement. The goal for the knee is, is to get to zero degrees, which means straightening it out completely and getting it at least to 120 degrees. I saw four of my patients today and um, all of them did Mako six months ago in January. I see my patients back at six months a lot of times and um, I had three of them uh, all over 130 degrees of flexion, which is, 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 is excellent. And zero pain, kneeling, able to go up and down stairs. One, one patient starting to play pickleball again. The other one's been playing golf since she said week three. Um, so um, these are the kind of things that I'm, I'm seeing. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, tough question. Can the patient be too young or too old for joint replacement? It seems the older I get uh, and the, the more I'm in practice, the more revision surgeries I'm doing. Revision surgeries, whether it's in the hip or knee, don't do as well as primary hips or primary knees. In other words, the first time you have it replaced, that's gonna probably be your best joint replacement. The reason for that is that the human body heals with scar tissue. Everything heals with scar tissue except for our liver and our bone. And so, uh, and the other thing is, as we um, do revisions, we lose more and more bone, and bone is very valuable uh, when you're doing revisions. Uh, so when you lose bone, then you have to put in more metal, more plastic, and again, not quite as good as the original bone, not quite as good as the original knee that was there in the first place. So, um, yeah, so I think that you want to be a little bit weary when people are very young and uh, have a severe arthritis. But I make exceptions to all of my rules. Um, the youngest person I ever did a hip replacement on was 13 years old. And this young person had, was, had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Um, she was placed on high dose steroids, high dose prednisone. And what prednisone does, especially when you're on high dose for a long period of time, it can make your bones die. And both her, her, her femoral heads, the, the ball portion of her hips died. And um, she was just in agony sitting there. I had only two choices I, I, I can give the parents and the patient. Fuse her hips so that her hips, I, I could fuse them so she'd be shorter. She'd have shorter legs. She'd walk like this, but she could walk. Um, she would sit kind of in a lean position, but not normal sitting. And she wouldn't be able to have probably normal relations with a man later on in life, nor be able to deliver a, a, a baby uh, um, normally. Um, so 
again, those are big decisions. Um, doing a hip replacement on her, and this is now 20 years ago, I could tell you, um, and her hips are still doing well, by the way, so I'm happy about that, but um, 20 years ago, I did one hip on her, and, um, and after a long discussion with the family, and she loved it so much, her two-week post-op for her wound check, she says, I want my other hip done tomorrow. For the first time in my life, I'm not in pain in this hip. So I did her other hip the next day. She's now 20 years out. She's still doing well. But uh, every two to four years I'm seeing her back, she's going to probably need to have her hips revised while she's in her 30s, late 30s, early 40s. But if you ask her, was it worth it and would be worth it to go, under, go another operation? Absolutely, because at 13, she was depressed and in pain all the time. So uh, my youngest knee replacement patient was 24 years old, and it was almost a similar story, only this patient had sickle cell trait, and this patient's um, sickling cells, red blood cells, caused um, his bone to die uh, in his knees, and he was, again, in 10 out of 10 pain, couldn't walk, couldn't stand, was miserable. I replaced one of his knees, and he was, again, another patient who came back at the two-week mark and said, I want my other, hip, my other knee replaced tomorrow, and I did his other knee. And, and he's now, I want to say, about six years out from his and still doing very well. So, and then as far as age, uh, we have to be careful. Um, I have, the oldest person I ever did an elective operation on was 99 years old. I did a total hip replacement on him. He, at 89 years old, came in to uh, see me and tell me that um, he's too old to have surgery. He had bone and bone arthritis. He had just lost the love of his life, who he was married to as a, a teenager, married for something like 80-something years. And, uh, well, not that long, I'm sorry, he's 89, so bad math. Um, he was married for like 70-something years, uh, but he married as a teenager, and he just lost his life. So he's depressed, he's down and out. Nine, Ten years later, at 99, he comes back to see me, and he says, Doc, I, I bet you don't remember me. And I'm, I'm pretty good with faces, but I'm terrible with names. So I looked at him, squinted right at him. I said, you're right, I don't remember you. I'll refresh your memory. I was the guy who told you at 89 years old, I was too old to have my hip replaced. Well, now I'm back, and I want to have my hip replaced. I said, okay, you'll be the oldest patient I've ever done an elective operation on, ever. He goes, I said, why now? Begs the question, why now? He says, I got remarried. I said, okay, you got remarried, so why now? True story, I want to be able to chase my wife around the house. So he wanted his new hip uh, to be able to chase his wife around the house. So we did a hip replacement and he lived another five years till he was 104 years old. And he was super happy. And the first thing he said to me uh, one month out from his surgery was, I should have done this 10 years ago. And my response to him is, you weren't ready 10 years ago. You were too old at 89. You were down, you were depressed, you weren't ready to have it done. But at 99, you were ready. So I tell people, you have to oftentimes be mentally, spiritually, physically ready to have it done, but age is just a relative contraindication. Well, that story just touched the hearts of everybody who's watching, seeing a lot of emotional comments. So, but a question that you kind of started to elaborate on a little bit was, how soon following a steroid injection could somebody have a new replacement? Yeah, so that, that has changed quite a bit. Um, when I went through medical school and went through my orthopedic training, we were told that you could do a cortisone shot and somewhere between six and eight weeks, you can do um, joint replacement. It shouldn't be a problem. And then um, in the early 2000s, a couple of papers came out and said, hmm, there's an increased incidence of infection in some meta-analysis, some studies that look at multiple studies with those patients that received the cortisone shot uh, before they had their joint replaced. And, um, and, and, then, and so then it went up from six to eight weeks to three months. And so for the vast majority of my career, I used to tell people we have to wait three months. Now, very good, large studies have been done looking at this, and another study, another meta-analysis confirmed it, that people are saying six months minimum. The, the infection risk triples if you do surgery on somebody within six months of receiving a cortisone injection in that same joint. Now, that's different if they get a cortisone injection in another joint. They get a cortisone shot in their shoulder, and they're having right hip replacement. That, to, to date, doesn't seem to be a factor. Most of the cortisone stays in the shoulder, but some of it does get in, in, in your system, but usually that doesn't stay in your system very long. But we're now, we're now doing a lot of studies that's showing that the cortisone stays in the joint and a knee or shoulder or hip much longer than we used to think, and it stays in uh, for probably at least six months. 
Um, one of my partners, we've talked about it, he, he believes that that effect probably goes beyond six months and he might be right. So uh, I'm now much more cautious on um, offering people a cortisone injection without telling them that up front first. Because a lot of patients, when they come to me, no one comes into the office and tells me, hey, doc, I want my hip replaced, I want my knee replaced. People come to me, I'm in pain. I, I can't do the things I want to do. I don't really want surgery. I want anything else that can be done with, other than surgery. And so a cortisone injection is very tempting. But the problem is this, when you have bone on bone arthritis in your hip or knee, I gave you that cortisone shot and you only get one week of relief and now you're in pain again, waiting that six months can seem like an eternity. So, um, and um, I, I finally have given in on a couple of patients who were, one was five months out, another one's four and a half months out. They were in such severe pain that they literally were uh, almost suicidal. They were in that much pain. They couldn't sleep at night. They couldn't. I said, well, you understand that the risk of infection now is triple. We're not going to my six month rule. We're doing this four and a half months, five months. They said, yes, I'm more than willing to accept that because I'd rather die than put up this pain any longer. That's how much pain they were in. And I did their joint replacements and, you know, they didn't get infected. I mean, the infection rate nationally on average in the knee is probably around 1%. For the hip, it's probably very close to 1% as well. Uh, one of the things that we're proud of at Tyworth Orthopedics um, is a, a protocol that we implemented right around 2009 when we were having this orthopedic hospital built uh, where we have surgical teams that just do orthopedics. That's all they do. I always tell people I think I'm a pretty good quarterback, but if I don't have a great team around me, I can get sacked. And we have unbelievable nurses, unbelievable surgical techs um, that make our job much easier. And Focusing on that subspecialization, I think, really, really um, uh, makes a difference. And um, our infection rate went from, in 2003 to 2010, it was around 1% for hips and knees. And now I could tell you that our infection rate for knees is less than 0.1%, and for hips, I think it's even less than that. So, um, which makes us one of the best in the Commonwealth of Virginia and one of the best in the country. And again, it wasn't by chance. Um, one of the neat things that we started to do back in 2010 was use a waterproof dressing called Aquacel. Um, and it's got silver in it, which is a natural antibiotic. Now some hospital systems have shown that their infection rate for total joints has been decreased by half just by using this dressing and not changing the dressings every day like we used to in a non-sterile technique. When you put that dressing on in the operating room, it's sterile and it goes on sterily and it stays on for two weeks. It creates a sterile environment that's adverse to any bacteria trying to set up shop. So I think that's just one of many things. The other things is we use something called transamic acid, which decreases the need for using a tourniquet when we're doing knee replacements and decreases the need of blood transfusions, which has been associated with a high infection rate. So controlling bone bleeding by using this drug before the start of the case and at the end of the case, I think has made a big difference and has enabled me and empowered me as a surgeon back in 2016 to make that leap of faith or start doing outpatient um, total joint replacements because I'm not worried about that patient needing a blood transfusion um, afterwards. So we have another question roll in. Uh, somebody asked, is there anything you can do for patients whose they said hip ball keeps popping out of place? Yes, yeah, so the hip ball keep on pop, popping out of place can be multifactorial, right? So uh, part of the issue could be um, the position of the implant itself and how it was done. Um, you know, a lot of my colleagues that do an anterior hip, for example, will say, well, there's less dissection through muscle, there's less that, and, and they rarely are ever, ever, ever dislocate. But having put in four um, hips that were done anteriorly uh, back in the place they can, particularly if they're, the components aren't in at the perfect position or there's something impinging the, 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 the um, stem, uh, the neck right here, and causing the ball to pop out of place. Um, with, with posterior approach or, or, or hardened approach or lateral approach, popping out of the back can happen when the hip flexes up too much and again impinges and it pops the hip out backwards. So anybody that has recurrent instability after having a joint replacement should have it looked at. Um, but sometimes it can be very difficult. I have a patient in her 80s who's had multiple dislocations and her, she has very little bone left surrounding her hip or her thigh, um, such to the point that 
it's almost impossible to do a revision on her because of her bone quality. We've made her a brace to prevent her from going too far this way, going too far this way, going too far this way, and her hip stays in place. And oh, by the way, her hip was done elsewhere. It wasn't done by our group, but she's come to our group um, since we uh, are clo live close by and she's gone to the emergency room where we've had to put it back into place. So, um, so yes, um, it can be done if you have an unstable hip I encourage you to get um, evaluated by the surgeon who did the surgery first. And if that surgeon doesn't um, provide solutions for you, then I would get a, um, a second opinion. So I think there's some curiosity about the image behind you. Um, is that a knee? That is a knee. Uh, and uh, we showed this last time when I, I did this uh, Facebook Live. And this is, again, what we do before I even start the case, while the patient's get, get, getting put to sleep and getting positioned, um, we go over the entire plan um, and, and go over in great detail. Um, these, a lot of these things can be confusing. Um, uh, the transepicondylar axis is kind of confusing, but it's the axis from this point to this point. Um, the PCA is this angle, and so these, these numbers don't mean anything to most people, but to an orthopedic surgeon, they mean everything because it, it helps me start thinking about the, the position. When we talk about flexion, we're talking about this, how's this component? Is it flexed this way or, 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 or ex, you know, extended, flex this way, or it's going into extension? So we, we can figure out that. This right here is looking at the size. These numbers are talking about the, the amount that's being resected of bone. One of the things I forgot to mention is, and I think the biggest difference between MAKO and using a navigation is there's less resection of bone. And I think that's huge. And the reason why I say that's huge I almost sound like Donald Trump, huge, um, is that um, the revision surgery, if let's say I'm doing a young patient who's in their 40s, and now 30 years later, they get 33 years out of their knee and they're super happy. Now that surgeon has to revise it. If they still have bone, they can still put in a fairly close to normal knee replacement rather than using a lot of metal and cones and other devices to try to hold and get stability of that implant. And I think that, again, doing more and more revisions, I'm really happy when, um, if, especially if they were done elsewhere, when I get in there and there's still good bone quality uh, for me to go ahead and do that revision, it makes the revision so much easier, so much faster. I think patients get a better outcome and they do, they do much better. So I think preserving the bone is, is key. So a lot of these numbers right here are telling us how much bone I'm going to be resecting, and that's in millimeters. Um, so I think that's a big difference. Any other comments, Griffin? I was going to say, I was just going to add to this, um, one of the features with MAKO is that we are able to actually look at the three different planes in our um, coronal, our transverse, and our sagittal, and we can see if we have any overhang of our implants, and we can correctly size and position them. Now, this isn't going to be our final position, this is just our preoperative. So if you look over here in the transverse plane on the tibia, we can see our implant and how it fits well. So we can think that's probably going to be a good size. <clears throat> and when we make our adjustments in travel, we, we know that right here, based on this, that, that size five is going to work great. Yeah, so again, the sizes are over here. When he's talking about uh, the, 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 the coronal, he's talking about front to back plane. When he's talking about axial, he's talking about top to bottom plane. And when he's talking about the sagittal, he's talking about right to left plane. So, um, so for those people that aren't familiar with those terms. But again, um, that's how we, we come up with the size. And all this done is preoperatively. And then in the operating room, when I actually use a probe and feed the computer the information, um, we verify it. And then we make changes based on what we're seeing real time as we analyze the knee and move the knee. So, it, it, so this is a great start, great preoperative template, but it's not set in stone, and it's something that we, we often change a little bit. We make little tweaks every now and then, but honestly, uh, anytime I made major tweaks before I did it, it seems like the computer is more right than me, and uh, we, we wind up going back to what the computer had suggested, uh, and, and that's, I think, fairly accurate. Right, and when we balance intraoperative... It's a humbling experience. Yes, <laughs> and we uh, make our cuts already, and we put our trials in, which are basically... Um, imitation implant so we can see get a good idea of how it's tracking we can see our live limb values and our ligament tension and we can actually go back and push the robot in and make changes which is a nice feature as well
So I think people would actually like to see the robot if that's possible. Yeah. Um, we, we, don't, we don't have um, our equipment to actually make it do any cuts or anything, but this is what the robot is right here. So this is our arm. And it's robotic assisted. So the arm's gonna be unlocked and there's gonna be a little gun right here. It's like it's called our handpiece. And it has our saw attached to it. So when the doctor is ready, I would control it and it have this arm here that I will be able. One of the things that I think is going to be exciting that's going to be coming in the near future is we have a patient that we have followed from the preoperative status all along her course and we have real time um, OR pictures of me actually doing a partial knee replacement which I think would be really exciting for people to see. Just, just hit the website. I think it will probably be out probably in about uh, a month or two as we get more follow-up data from this patient that we followed preoperatively all the way through her perioperative period in the operating room and now postoperatively. So it will be like kind of like a, a, a small biopic on a patient's experience which I think will be really exciting. And there you'll see real life film me operating on her, her knee, which I think will be exciting. But this, this allows me multiple different angles to go in. This also spins. And the neat thing about it is when I'm looking at the screen and I have the saw, it won't let me go beyond any boundary. So it has something called the AccuStop, which just stops me from uh, cutting anything that should not be cut, number one, or making a bad cut to begin with. So it really enhances uh, the precision. So if I sneeze, uh, for example, <laughs> it's not going to let me make an additional cut um, for that. So, so to touch on that real quick, um, as, as uh, Dr. Kingston was talking about, you, you have the bone pins in your, in your knee, in your tibia, and your femur that have the arrays attached to it. And when we register it, so now the robot knows exactly where your knee is. So when we're going to make our cuts, bring the, robot on, the robotic arm in, he presses the trigger, and it will auto-align to the exact cutting plane that we're going to be cutting. And that's why it's robotic-assisted, and then the surgeon can make his cuts and do his, his thing there. <laughs> yeah, I'm still in control of the robot. The robot doesn't control me, not yet anyway. Uh, so, uh, but yes, so, uh, and, and I, can, I can change the angle of the cut uh, the way I want it uh, to protect the patient's soft tissue or anything like that, depending on the bigger, stronger, muscular people are sometimes more difficult to do because uh, you have to push things out of the way still to, to do it. Uh, but we have a really nice setup uh, that actually is almost assistant-free now uh, to do the cuts now where we don't have to have our assistants uh, retracting the things out of the way. So I encourage you to, I think the next uh, session that, I, that I'm excited about will be a biopic done on one of my patients who uh, is going through this entire process and will have real OR video uh, using the robot. So I'm excited about that. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Well, and I think that's going to do it for us today. Do you have any other closing remarks, Dr. Kingston? No, I, I think that, uh, you know, I'm really excited. I, 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 you know, it's gotten to the point where, um, truthfully, I want another robot. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and I want another robot, and I'm pleading to any hospital administrators that might be out there listening. Um, I want another robot because we are getting busier. Uh, everybody wants it. And uh, currently, from, for example, for my older inpatient patients that have uh, multiple medical problems, I'm now booking out to January. And this is the longest in my career that I'm booking out. And uh, I want to be able to get these patients in a more timely fashion. So getting a second robot, I think, will help with that. I think when the newer applications come out for shoulder and then eventually spine, we're going to need another robot after that. So this is going to be, this is the wave of the future. The future is now, and uh, I'm excited about how busy and how much, I mean, it's exceeded expectations. I mean, I think everybody here will tell you that as orthopedic surgeons within our own group are fighting over the robot. I'm told sometimes I only get to do two cases with the robot on a certain day, and that's it. And then another day, I don't even get to use the robot period, end of story, because uh, one of my partners is using it. So even though I'm one of the senior partners, 
sometimes I still have to bite the bullet and not use it. So it's a, it's a nice problem to have, to be busy. It's a nice problem um, to have um, um, in the sense that everybody wants it, and I, I can see why. Personally, if I ever had to have my knee or hip replaced, I honestly would want uh, uh, the surgeon to be doing a macoplasty procedure on me and not use a standard instrumentation. So I just want to remind everybody, uh, Dr. Kingston will be available on an upcoming mini episode of our new miniseries Q&A with DOA. If you have any questions that you'd like him to answer, any comments or anything like that, feel free to comment them down below on the video. We just want to thank you all again for tuning in. Thanks, everybody. Good night.